cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Praise Him, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. 
Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he has acted in favor of created. He made them stand fast forever and ever. He gave them a law which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You see monsters and all these. Fire and hail, snow and fog. Tempestuous wind doing his will. Mountains and all hills. Fruit trees and all cedars. Wild beasts and all cattle. Creeping things and the birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples. Princes and all rulers of the world. Young men and maidens. Old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name only is exalted. His splendor is over earth and heaven. He has raised up strength for his people and praise for all his loyal servants. The children of Israel, a people who are near them. stand as we are able for the gospel hymn on page six. And the large print bulletin is on page eight. <coughs> if you love me, we will sing it once before and once after the gospel reading. If you
morning. of the Diocese of Michigan, and there aren't many of us to supply, and I am really happy to be here with you today and to be able to help out Steve. Won't you be, won't you be seated? Oh yeah, and I come all the way from Celine, so I've had a, a ride today. Thank you. You're most welcome. I'll sleep on the way home. My chip is, is, is now taking a nap. I'm going to sleep all the way. <laughs> Not long ago, I was driving, and Jim was my passenger in the passenger seat, of course. I had to brake hard and fast. Out flew my arm across Jim. Jim's a big guy. Uh, None of my arm was going to keep him in place. And he laughed. And he remembered how we protect our children, even with an arm extended, though they have seat belts on. My father in the 1950s installed airplane seat belts around little kids that were real big and stiff. But he really believed in those things. But even then, up would go the arm. He loves us so. Well, I didn't have any. I didn't want to disappoint Jim because my arm flying out these days is more like to keep my purse from flying into the wheel well. <laughs> but you know, I still do that with passengers. An action that still means love to me. You probably have a memory of an action because of love. A look, a hand offered, an embrace, an attentive ear. It all connects us to something far deeper within ourselves and with other people. The important moments in our lives are about making relationships. The important memories, listening, following through, even getting close to what might frighten us. The family systems guru, Murray Bowen, often said, watch what people do, not what they say. Watch what people do. In the first lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, and also through the rest of our readings, that good news is all over the place. Watch for love in action. Not just the word put out, and I do mean word cap, small w, but that action. Watch what people do, not what they say. In that first lesson, Peter is called to Joppa, Peter, you are baptizing the uncircumcised. Peter was on fire. Peter, the one of the rest of them who still hadn't gone. Peter was the one who said it didn't matter anymore. You hear it in the letter of James as well. These things don't matter. Those kind of rules exclude. And so he baptized anyway. Amazing times. God gave love and forgiveness even to the Gentiles who were the outsiders in the day. Today, I ask you, who are the untouchables today? Who are the shunned? Who are outsiders? Who don't obey our rules? And that can be very, very broad as about who doesn't obey the rules. What rules? You heard the scriptures. What God has made clean, we must not call profane. Do not make a distinction between them and us. The gospel lesson has us back in the upper room. It's Monday, Thursday again, that lesson. And it's called Jesus' Farewell Discourse. If you go to seminary, you have to have that to fill in the line, you know, for the test. But it's that farewell discourse. Jesus speaks of the most essential aspect of life between them. What must be recalled, what must be done by them once he is gone. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That 
really kind of pushes the envelope where their comfort level is. And I would say it pushes us today as well. How do you love just as Jesus loved? What does it mean to travel out of our comfort zone like Peter did? And what's the radical love that Jesus insisted the disciples keep on keeping on? After all, we have a lot of love that we see written, but love's a verb, too. So what's the action that we're being called to, to continue the life of Jesus? We are the body of Christ, we say. Peter was baptizing, welcoming Gentiles into God's promises, outside of tradition, and to the uncircumcised. That's a really big deal today. A big deal. Well, we've heard what love is repeated over and over from the Christian story, passed down from generation to generation, repeated in the five covenants of our baptismal vows. You see, that's a wonderful hanging you have out there, just in that little alcove that's near the elevator. If you haven't looked at it, it's a great, it's beautifully done but it also has those five covenants. It's really more about action. We can say what we believe, but this is what we say we will do with God's help. We're called to the poor, the hungry, the helpless, the sick, and the dying to build on Jesus' ministry. We hear that over and over again. So who are the poor these days? Well, how about the underemployed? Those who are disenchanted, those who are sometimes depressed, sometimes they're mad. A lot of people don't want to get close to them. They're afraid. How about the disinterested ones and the forgotten old, the abused and the threatened? It does not have to be in the gospel by the words that we understand situations of today, but the word is that we continue to love. So what does it mean today? I, I wrote down a couple of things here. When we talk about the poor, the helpless, those in need. And I wrote down about prison. A good deal of people in prison are afflicted with fetal alcohol syndrome. They've never had a chance of living. A lot of mental illness in prisons. And while we talk about rehabilitation, many have not been rehabilitated in the first place. There is so much there. I knew churches who made relationships with prisoners before they came out of prison. I was the <clears throat> representative to the Department of Corrections in the Diocese of Arizona, and it used to just really get to me. I wrote an article about it once for the Diocese newspaper, and it ended up in a box. And it said, opinion article. Okay, that diocese wasn't ready to step forward. People were coming out feeling on fire about it. And then we're not going to feel on fire about everything. All ministries that need to be done. But I'll tell you, the Nazarene church was, whatever you may think of them, how, how evangelical or literalist they are, they got to know people in prison. They were with them when they came out. They had clothes from them that were appropriate. They had job interviews lined up with the prison personnel for the skills they had. They had skin in the game. They were really doing the love of Jesus up front person. Years ago, I was over at church in the western part of our diocese. Truck stops on an Easter morning. No, it wasn't Easter. It was when we changed the savings times. I forget which one way or the other, but I was there an hour early. My husband called me up and said, why don't you go to church an hour early? Well, it was only about, a, uh, um, eh, I would say about a mile, two miles from 94. So I thought, well, nobody's here to make the coffee. You don't want me making the coffee, believe me. And so I went back up to the truck stop. There are three large truck stops there. And it is absolutely full of truckers even at that hour in the morning, they couldn't go to church. They couldn't go to an AA meeting. They were ready to turn around and leave. There were minimum wage workers 
in all those places where you eat. It's not enough money or hard to live on. There were homeless who lived out in the boonies. And there were the sex workers. And there was also, I'm told, sometimes the sex trade was uncovered as well. All that out really right among the people. Well, there's so much to do there. One um, pastor said to me, we need to get those prostitutes out of there. It's a big Irishman, a slug in the arm. No, we need to go there. Listen, find out if they need help them to get out of it or help them to stay healthy. Whatever it is, they need the love of Christ there. And if, thirst, if people are thirsty, we hear that in the Gospels. What's Jesus stand on everyone having unpolluted waters? Healing? Well, Jesus showed us everyone is entitled to care of body, mind, and spirit. What's happening with that these days? Naked? Well, I haven't seen many naked people around these days, at least that didn't have any clothes. But what about naked knees? Naked knees. The unemployed, those ones who are aged out of work, even at age 50. Where is Jesus for them? I know churches who have turned their parish hall during the week into places where people could come and use it as a computer center bring their laptops and do the work they had to do and be able to make the resumes for places. They had a space to be. And they had a space to be with one another and they had some coffee and donuts. And then there's the embitter. With any church, the anger and the pain of being turned away. Those people see no purpose that the church offers. And they're still looking for meaning and purpose. You know, I've had people willingly disclose, and yes, I am a priest, but before I was a priest, that was when I was the representative, I was a layperson. I got to sit out there, darn it. Um, I found people who were willing to disclose personal issues in their lives. More than you can imagine, actually, when we remember who we are, and we take the time to ask and listen to them. Not decide what they need, but hear what they really need. We oftentimes avoid even our personal lives about talking about serious issues. Why? Because we're discomforted. Fear of making a hassle of discord in the church. Disagreement? Oh my, don't want to appear foolish, don't want to appear wrong. Painful. The anger that we know we carry perhaps on a subject that we don't like getting close to. Well, here's a disclosure, as they say. We are called even to what and who and when we are uncomfortable with. For in them, you can tell who they are because we see our own vulnerability, our own fear, and still we are called to take action. Jesus stood face to face with authority and as is said, he spoke that gentle truth to power. In the reign of Christ, continues through the members of his body by putting flesh on his promises. Our bone, our vocal cords, our hands, our feet to walk. We made good the promises of God by getting our skin into the game. You see, our gatherings for worship are really meant to be points of, dis of departure for us corporately and individually, individually. When the words start to go, I know I need more. Pardon me. God speaks to us, and we reply with loving action. We move outward into the rest of our lives, tomorrow into the world in active works of ministry, though it may not be called that ministry. How does an accountant work with their clients? How do they give joy 
even when it may be a really rough time for them? How do they be the person that someone else can depend upon? How we live our lives and in our vocations is God's love expressed in the world as well. The ethical life, the moral life, the saying what's uncomfortable, even though it may not be popular. Well, I name some needs. Are there others Christ is speaking to in your hearts? Who are you called to serve, even if you're afraid or it's inconvenient or nobody else is joining you in it? If you have some that should come to mind today, name them, won't you please, in the prayers of the people, either aloud or silently. But I would ask you that you have a great response voice. Best response voice I've heard in church in a while. So consider naming it aloud, who you feel called to, who's not, who's being neglected. All of us need to hear the Holy Spirit at work in one another. Love, well, it doesn't mean we have to like all people, but we're called to serve all people anyway. Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, used to carry in his wallet a small piece of paper that said, living is service. Living is service. The sign of Christ, we well, you know you where you've got it, you've got it on your forehead. You can almost feel it if you think about it. And if you haven't been anointed on your forehead, you might want to ask Pastor Steve to do so for you. It is a wonderful moment to know you are sealed as Christ's own forever. We all do it imperfectly, how we reach out, how we are the skin in the game, how we put ourselves in making God's promises true. But we're still called to do love. I was reading a reflection by Pastor Mary Ludy this past week. She's a uh, Congregationalist uh, professor in one of their seminaries. And she wrote, The world can be forgiven for shrinking from us who claim to be raised by Christ if we can't offer our bodies as proof of our claims. We are fleshless, boneless, woolless, untouchable, if we don't have real human skin in the game. That's quite a challenging thing to read. Lord knows we're wounded too. And we're very capable of making the relationships in loving service. Jesus in those last times told his people, I give you a new mandate. Perhaps a director, we might say. Love as I have loved you, you'll be known by your love. I believe he was saying, you gotta have skin in the game. No majoring in minors. Do more than get along. Believe. Love. Those first disciples' ministry was short-lived. They came to horrible ends. But they did the work that is the root of our faith and our stories. We wouldn't have that if they didn't take to action to do what Jesus asked them to do. There's this piece in the scripture in John. It's not this week's. It's not next week's. It falls in the chapter between our lectionary. And it's one of my favorite. When Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will also do the works that I do. In fact, you will do greater works than these. You will do greater works than I have done. The world is right to, to doubt us if we walk through the pain all around and beyond. This is Mary Ludy again. Talking about needs, hopes, and ecstatically mounting resurrection. Hallelujah! if we don't have skin in the Jesus game, so to speak. Suffering people don't need a church that ghosts them. That just isn't in the line of view. They know nothing about it. As a little, a little exercise I'll give you, 
when you go to the grocery store or you're in one of the fast places to get your gas and you see a clerk at the counter, particularly young people, say, hey, I'm looking for Trinity Episcopal Church. Can you tell me where it is? You may not like the answer. In all of our, in all the churches I have served, it was not a happy time to come back the next week and say so. Skin in the game, making good on God's promises by what we do, where we put our feet, how we open our mouths. Well, that was to be the end of the sermon, but I woke this morning and I sat straight up. Boy, I woke at five this morning after spraying the cats who were having a fight with the water pistol. Why is, why, and I said, a really good shot. Even in the, in the dark, I could see that ball of fur and get up right on. <laughs> By the way, I am a uh, sport founder, so I don't feel bad about saying there's a voice to be had about, about guns in this world, too. I shot competition track or sport, sporting place for 40 years of my life. Actually, I got to add that it's now 50 years of my life. Well, when I woke up, I realized that I left out something important. The comfort of God. That God comforts. And Jesus said we're expected to do the same because we live in the joy of that comfort. The assurance of it. But in the wake of more violence by weapons against people of color and the persistent violence of one nation against another, I read quickly what Diane Butler Bass wrote this morning. And if you don't follow her, it's easy to follow her online. It's free. She's one, considered one of the most esteemed theologians of our time. She's not ordained, and she's an Episcopalian. That should be pretty good, don't you think? <laughs> she said, Revelation, and that's the one I wasn't paying much attention to because, Lordy P. Revelation has been used against people and has been used against Christ, in my estimation, for many, many years. It's not understood. Revelation didn't predict how the world would end. Instead, professors, even at her evangelical seminary, insisted that John's apocalypse function as a comforting text for a persecuted church. A comforting text almost in code, that those who were persecuted by Rome and in Rome and up across the countryside. Where do we see persecution in our time? And rank, violent oppression. She goes on. The book revealed the evils of this age assuring Christians that a triumphant God would overcome all their pain and all their suffering. The book of Revelation is built around a central metaphor, the Roman Empire, and like every empire, is a murderous beast. According to the writer of Revelation, the empire destroys everything, takes everything, and controls everything. The empire was born of violence, and all it knows is war. It marks all its subjects with death. It waters the world with weeping, its seas flooding the earth, with sorrow. Humankind mourns under its sway. And lament is the life we experienced with empire. Tears are very character of empire. In all I have offered to you this morning, I believe deep from my soul and my heart that God is about making new things drawing us forward, using the very gifts, tweaking us, the gifts that we have to indeed bring love to the world. There's so many things that we can take action, loving action on. Well, we are both the receivers of God's love and we are motivated by God's love in the life of Jesus and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit to actively love. Mary said it. Suffering people do not need a church that ghosts them. Sidney Carter is a friend of my late husband's. 
all through their beginning years in school in England called Christ Hospital, and then Bailey and, Ol Bailey and Oxford. <coughs> Sidney was a writer, a soft and gentle man. He set a shaker melody to words. The Lord of the Dance. I'm sure you probably know. I am the Lord of the Dance, said he. Well, Sidney wrote a lot of folk tunes in the 50s and 60s, and in churches, young people were drawn to them. One is called the Present Tense. I didn't know about this one, despite having most of his books, I think, his music. But I learned about it from the Primus of Scotland, who had come to Kansas City and was speaking in my church, the first church I was in as an associate rector. And the final verse goes like this. Your holy hearsay, hearsay, is not evidence. Give me the good news in the present tense. What happened 1900 years ago may not have happened. How am I to know? The living truth is what I long to see. I cannot live on what used to be. So shut your Bibles up and show me how. The Christ you talk about is living now. That's really tough words. How do we show the Christ we talk about is living now? How do we answer those who think it's a bunch of malarkey, who have not set foot in the church? People pay attention to what we do far more than what we say. Let us pray. May our churches startle the world with our resurrected presence, O oh Christ. Make us more than what we say. Embolden us to show Jesus by our love. Make us your living, breathing body, skin in the game, solid, listening, and on the line to fully love one another in your hurting creation. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Let us stand to affirm our faith in the words of the disciples, slightly edited and beautifully edited, I might say. Jeez, that's great. Apostles. Especially for all those who have asked for our prayers. 
Any other announcements? Any birthdays that are being celebrated? I uh, turned 80 on Thursday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God bless you with many more. Yes, any other birthdays, anniversaries? Okay, we will sing happy birthday to you.
up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to our God. It is right to be our thanks and praise. Glorious God, we give you thanks and praise. For at his resurrection, Jesus burst forth from the tomb to break the tangles of despair and death, to shine forth the divine love once again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the eternal chorus of all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
these are the gifts of God. For us, the holy people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and lived for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Songs for Communion, beginning on page 16 in the large print bulletin, it is on page 22, with As We Gather at Your Table.
Let us continue to pray. God of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. And may the way of God direct us. And may the Almighty bless us this day and always. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. Our closing song is on page 18. In the large print, it is in page 24. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. 